Hi, I'm Checo Varese, Director of Photography of the Chapter 2, and you're listening to the Go Creative Show. Hey, everyone. My name is Ben Consoli. I am a director and owner of BC Media Productions, and this is the Go Creative Show, the show dedicated to creative professionals in the video production and filmmaking industries. Today, we welcome the cinematographer for IT Chapter 2, Checo Varese. Checo shares how he made Pennywise both horrifying and engaging, how he lights for the darkness, the digital de-aging process, and so much more. The Go Creative Show is supported by Rule Boston Camera, Hedge.Video, Shutterstock, Magnanimous Rentals, and PremiumBeat.com. So I am so excited. It Chapter 2 came out. I've been waiting for this since the very end of It Chapter One, and it certainly delivered. I mean, I'm a huge It fan regardless, and I loved the first one, loved the second one, really great. I'd love to hear what you guys think of the film, and of course, our uh, episode today talking about the film. So let us know on our social media. Uh, We talk about a lot. We talk about a lot. Uh, Of course, that super controversial scene at the very beginning, the gay bashing scene. Um, We talk about of course, how he lights and shoots everything. And there's just so much in this episode. You guys are going to absolutely love it. So a couple of things before we dive in. First, um, I want to let you guys know that on our social media, we give you, the listener, an opportunity to have your questions asked on the show. So uh, whenever we have upcoming guests, we post it on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and give you an opportunity to, in the in the responses there, Uh, let us know what questions you'd like to ask. We've been doing it for a couple of months now, and it's been going great. Your questions are awesome, uh, sometimes better than mine, a lot of times better than mine. (laughs) And um, we love to have your voice heard on the show. So please follow us across all of those platforms, and you'll get an opportunity to have your question on the show. We give you a little shout out too. And of course, all things Go Creative Show are right there at our website, gocreativeshow.com. But the best way to follow the show is to subscribe. That's the best way. That way you never miss an episode. So go to your favorite podcast app, look for Go Creative Show, hit subscribe, and that way you are up to date with all things Go Creative Show and you get to check out our fantastic guests. And wow, do we have some amazing ones on the way. So uh, you're going to want to subscribe there. All right. I want to take a quick minute and talk about Shutterstock. Com. Shutterstock has been with Go Creative Show for a few years now. And we absolutely love those guys. Uh, of course, it's where you need to go for stock footage and photos and music and all sorts of stuff uh, is right there for you at Shutterstock. But they've added something new lately. And I don't know if you guys have tried it out, but I strongly suggest you do. They have something called Elements, Shutterstock Elements. Now, what are Elements? Well, they are blockbuster quality video effects. And they're created by industry professionals. I'm talking about things like 4K lens flares, uh, transitions, video kits with things like smoke and fire explosions, and so much more. And the cool thing is, is I am certainly not a visual effects, uh, uh, visual effects, what? I don't even know the word. That's how, that's how not good at visual effects I am. I don't even know the word for it. Um, I stink at it, but I'm still able to use these Shutterstock elements. They're perfect for people like me and professionals because they work across all different NLEs. Uh, I'm a big Final Cut Pro 10 person, as you all know, and I absolutely love playing with these things. And I know you will too. So head over to shutterstock.com, hover over footage, and right there in the drop down will be elements. You guys are going to love these things. Whether you are a super professional or you are a complete amateur like me, you're going to love playing around with these things. All right. So much to get to and can't wait to start. Our interview with Checo Vodeche, the cinematographer for It, Chapter 2. So I'm here with Checo Vodeche. He's the director of photography for It, Chapter 2. And so excited to have you on, Checo. This is going to be a great one. Thanks for being on. Thank you so much, Ben. And it's a pleasure to be with you and with your audience. And I hope I can share as much as possible, my experience in each chapter two and in another plethora of exciting projects. Absolutely. This is a great opportunity for me and the audience to kind of talk with you and learn with you. And so we're, we're really thankful you're here. I'm here and uh, I'll try to be as concise and precise as possible and with the, with the flourish language that I use as a metaphor half of the time because I want to avoid 
technicality is too much. <laughs> you're and, not a, uh, you're not a super technical guy. Yes, I am, but I don't think that is the trade that a cinematographer or an aspiring cinematographer should concentrate on. That it's very easy to get lost in the amount of pixels or the amount of megabytes or the size of a frame. Just to give you an example, today I had a whole conversation with my DIT that it's fantastic. And at some point I said, whoa, 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 hold on a second. That's way over what I need to know. So just stop right there. I just need to do this so I can understand what I'm aiming for. And then when we have a coffee in our hands, we can talk about that so I learn it. But that's not my priority. My priority is to understand story, framing, and uh, and, and, and enthusiasm for looks as opposed to just the technicalities of it. What was your DIT trying to teach you today? Well, we're shooting a project. It's a pilot for Amazon and uh, through Sony. And there is the appetite to shoot 4K. Yeah. Um, which is a respectable appetite. I do have my questions about the need of, of the 4K workflow being the mantra, which we all have to follow. Uh, when the tools we have are not necessarily or specifically designed for 4K. And let me give you an example. 4K, it's a frame. And I may meet, may not be completely accurate on this, but it's a frame that it's the chip is bigger than 90% of the lenses out there in the market. So most of the lenses were designed during the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, for a super 35 lens size. Mm. And uh, the 4K lens size is larger than the, the lens size of a super 35 frame. So when you go into a true 4K, you're actually shooting the barrel itself. So it, the lens will vignette. So we're having all these conversations by which the Venice with certain lenses can shoot 4K, but a certain specific compression five by six, four by three. So in the four by three, you can only go to 30 frames, hundred frames in the five by six, you can go to 30 frames only. And like, whoa, 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 hold on a second. Let's go into the details on paper because it's extremely complicated. I think we've achieved a, 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 a peak in technology that has surpassed some of the tools we have to, to work with and those tools are taking longer just because of the design and the manufacturing of the tools or even the, 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 the financial appetite of a production to use those tools. But it's, ultimately, it's extremely simple to broadcast. Sorry, it's extremely simple to play 4K in your computer and your iPhone and et cetera. Yeah. And that's easy because somebody sort of figured it out. But now we need to catch up on how to execute it in a in a in an organic yet within the budget way whatever the budget may be i mean even a movie like it has budget constraints because the appetite it's always bigger than the budget no matter what you do in a little project it's always bigger in a big project it's bigger anyway you know so it's it's getting to a point where it's a very complicated in very sophisticated language that we're start, starting to talk just because we can, you know. Um, wonderful movies have been shot in film, and Apocalypse Now, it's probably a resolution that is lower than 4K, and now the mandate is to shoot even a reality TV in 4K, and that mandate has to do with other reasonings and other appetites, and, uh, and it's getting to the point that it's hindering the creative part. So it's, it's, I think we're in a transition and that every transition it's complicated and painful and it's a wonderful transition, but we are in a complicated moment that requires a lot of let's think for a minute and let's really figure out what we're doing. What did you shoot it chapter two on? Let me give you an example about that. I will event a friend of mine just bought a Porsche 911 fantastic car that does 260 miles an hour. Basically, you can only drive to 120 kilometers an hour in Germany in one Bahnhof. The rest of your life, you have to drive it at 65 in the 101. 
Yeah. You know, so not because you can, you should. So that's what I mean. You know, we have the tools. We, we may not be able to achieve it. To get back to chapter two, chapter two was shoot, was shot um, in a full frame resolution Alexa raw uh, for a delivery in the extraction of two four oh two three nine frame. So mm. we had a little bit of a bigger bigger frame, and um, and that was f- shot with spherical lenses. The first this was the first movie that I saw in Dolby Vision. Um, in the Dolby theater near where I live. I it's been in there. It's the theater's been in there for a while. I just haven't, you know, seen anything in it. This is the first time I saw it. The projection was so crisp, so beautiful. I mean, the movie looks amazing. It was so much fun to to watch and experience. Having been a fan of it, um, you know, even the TV movie from way back when, and of course the first um the first chapter of it a couple of years ago, uh, if chapter two, I think, delivered on every front, you did a fantastic job. Thank you so much. You were lucky to see it there. I I saw two two. I mean, I saw the movie many times in the color correction bay, but I saw two, and one was in a Dolby theater that was amazing, and then I sort of sneak in in the back of a an IMAX theater, and it was it blew my head. Yeah, I was like, wow, oh my god, did we really shoot all this? <laughs> I wasn't there when we shot that. <laughs> so no, it, 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 it is a massive undertaking. And I think, um, my director and friend, Andy Muschietti did an amazing job on, on, on pushing every boundary and pushing every one of us to the limit of our creativity and, 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 and patience and everything. And, um, to, to make, to make that a, a great, great movie and, 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 and undertaking, you know? How did you get involved in the film in the first place? Because I know you didn't shoot the first chapter, but you're shooting the second chapter. How did that all happen? Andy and I go back uh, emotionally many years. He He's from Argentina. I lived in Argentina. He was a story, a young storyboard artist when I was a young steady cam operator. Um, but then we shot a few commercials in Europe as a commercial director and myself as a director of photography. And then he offered me a pilot we did together uh, two years ago in October, November of 2017. Uh, we shot a pilot. We clicked in and it was a, a lot of fun. And and then at the end of the pilot said, would you shoot a movie with me again? And I said, of course, whenever. Because I love you and, and it will be great. And then a few months later, Barbara Muschietti, his sister and producer partner and, and partner in crime, called me and said, you know, we're prepping in chapter two. Would you like to shoot it? And I was silent for like 20 good seconds. Yeah. And I'm like, and I'm like uh, that would be an honor. And thank you so much. And and I run and I rented each chapter one and watched it, which I did eventually when it came out. But I, I watch it as an audience. Now I watch it as a, oh, my God, I have to fill these shoes. You know? Yes. And, and, and of course, I said yes, even before thinking, you know. And oh then God. I said, oh, my God, what am I doing? <laughs> <laughs> Did you? So you had that feeling of almost like anxiety about it. I think you can eliminate the world almost. Really? Yes, of course. You have anxiety in any job. You have anxiety in the little commercial I'm going to shoot next week. And I have anxiety. If you don't have anxiety and you, ha- you don't have a, a full commitment, you're not fulfilling the dreams of someone like a director. Imagine for Andy. Andy, it's. It's his passion. It's his movie. It's his the, the the work of a year and a half of his two years of his life. And if I show up like ah, it's another job, then there is no respect for his commitment and his sacrifices. There must have been something though jumping onto a film series in the second one. It's like there's only going to be two. The first one's already done. Everybody loved it. And now you're coming into the second one. Did you have that feeling of like, you know, maybe it shouldn't even be me. Maybe it should have just been the original cinematographer. Like, did those thoughts go through your mind? Well, with all the respect that Chung Hoon, which I never met, and coincidentally, we found each other in a edit suite in, in, a, in a 
in a color correction facility the other day and we laughed and we hugged each other and we took a picture. Uh, we never met before. Oh, wow. Uh, and it was literally the day it was opening and it was complete serendipity. He was color correcting his latest movie and I was talking to my colorist about my next project and we crossed in the cafeteria. Wow. Like, yeah, it was beautiful. I think the gods of filmmaking were looking down at that point. Um, no, I think, well, first of all, I think there are two things that happen. One is I'm an irresponsible person, so I say yes before thinking. So that was done before even. <laughs> yeah. before well, who's going to say no? I mean, come on. Yes, that, that exactly. is, you can't say exactly. no to that. Exactly. That's the first thing. You know, of course I'm going to say yes. That's the first thing. And the second thing is I don't think it's a sequel. I think it's another movie. Yeah. You know, each chapter two for, for your audience that haven't seen it yet, um, which I hope there are very few. Um, it, chapter two is made of two movies. There is one movie that belongs to the past of the Losers Club. So yeah. it it gives it 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 follows the life of these young kids that that spend their summer trying to survive this killer Pennywise that tries to kills them. Uh, Successfully in some cases. And then there is a chapter two, the adults. And I was more interested in the adults because that were that's where the imprint in my signature, I wouldn't say signature, my input and my and my passion could be different from each chapter one. Hmm. So it was very, very interesting. We had to shoot each chapter one pieces as if they were shot two years and a half before. So we use similar lenses. We use similar camera moves. We repeated wardrobe and staging and, and, and setting and to down to a science. So you don't betray the, the audience expectations because the audience will, will, will see chapter one right before each chapter two. And they will say, oh, this one looks different. So in that fraction of a second, when you lose the audience attention, you're never, never going to get them back. You, you'll always feel like, oh, my God, I lost them for a second. And that precious second may distract them from a scare, a joke, a passion, you know. So you, we had to be repeating in, in the best way possible each chapter one. But then in each chapter two, I could give free reign to 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 my responsibility and my darkness and and the dark soul I have somewhere hiding and, yes. and, and come up with all those crazy uh, lighting plots and, and, and camera moves that that make the movie so much fun. I wanted to ask you about the scenes that are with the cast of chapter one. Did you shoot all of them? Like, were all those brand new scenes that you did for this movie or were some of them originally shot when they were filming chapter one? I believe there is a flashback that it's made of two pieces. One piece is a repetition of a scene that they shot in each chapter one. And the rest of the scene that you never saw, the developing of the scene that you never saw in each chapter one was shot by us. Wow. So there's literally a scene that is half, half 2015 and has 2019, whatever, 18. How so, are yeah. you dealing with the kids? I mean, kids in two years for that age, you grow up a lot. You know, you look different. Did you, well, did you run into there, tra- challenges? There, yes. There is the magic of cinema. So you, 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 you adjust the wardrobe so it's still, you know, you give them a 13-year-old wardrobe in the first movie and you give them a 16-year-old wardrobe that looks as saggy as the 13-year-old wardrobe. So there are tricks. There are physical tricks that you do. Yeah. You keep the camera in certain positions because the angle of this kid is better on this side and he doesn't seem to have aged too much on this side. Um, if you are having them interacting with an adult that it's not a well-known adult or a formerly known adult, you make you you cast a role for that role a, 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 a taller gentleman. So so the proportion between their size and the taller size is the same. Mm. There was a, a, an occasion by which the table or whatever whatever set pressing was there had to be oversized a little bit so they they look shorter compared to the actual size of the place so there there were a lot of mechanical and practical 
solutions to that. And then there were some visual effects solution um, to the aging, which is a technology that has been advanced a lot. Yeah. And uh, it started a few years ago with, let's get rid of that wrinkle or let's get rid of that scar or let's get rid of this, you know, pimple here and there. And it developed into, you know, whatever, Benjamin Button and then and, and de-aging and aging now has become something that it's doable and it's affordable and there's something that you don't consider a, 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 an impossibility. You know, you don't consider writing a movie like that. You consider, you don't consider that a sin. You consider something somehow practical. So the company that does that, that I believe it's called Lola, but someone should check, double check on that. Uh, does the visual effects for aging and de-aging. Uh, it's a very specialized and, and it's very complex. If you want me, I can go through the details. You, you scan the actors, the contemporary actors, um, and then you create an algorithm for every actor by which the computer knows that the nose and the, you know, the, 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 the nose and the cheeks are a little thinner. So, so when you see the actual shot of the current actor, you start compressing the chins and compressing the cheeks and then like making the nose a little bit smaller. And that's the, the, the automated part. And then the artist comes in and, and makes that blend into a reality. You know, it's a very laborious and very sophisticated process that I'm not part of it and happens, happens in a dark room somewhere for weeks and weeks and weeks. Did you have to do anything in your lighting or cinematography for the digital de-aging process? No, not really. I mean, yes, to a certain extent, but nothing that would be hindering the creativity or anything. I mean, you have the shot and then all of a sudden the actor had to go away and you shoot a plate. Yeah. Because because the information is behind behind the head that now it's an inch taller or two inches taller. It doesn't exist when you make it two inches shorter. So the actual information behind them doesn't exist for the actual shot. So you have to shoot a plate for every shot. But that's not something unusual or something painful. It's something just part of the process. So in this film, uh, It Chapter 2 takes place 27 years after Chapter 1. And uh, Chapter 1 is sometime in the 80s, I believe. And so this the it Chapter 2 is more you know closer to present day. I think the challenge I, I would say is contemporary. Yes. Yeah. For it, all intensive purposes is contemporary. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Um, and, and as I'm watching the film, I'm thinking to myself, okay, these are completely new characters. Um, they're well, not new characters. They're, they're new actors playing familiar characters, but we're supposed to kind of know who they are. We're, they're supposed to feel the same. Their characters are supposed to be the same as they were, but just now adults. I would love to know how you approach that from a cinematography and lighting standpoint to keep the audience feeling like these characters are familiar to them, even though they're totally different people. I think, to be fair, I think that was a job and a task that's related more to Andy and the actors. Uh, they did a great job of familiarizing themselves with their former young versions you know, yeah. in, in, in adding 27 years of suffering or happiness or unhappiness or, or whatever their arcs brought them in, 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 during their lives, you know? So I don't know that I was hindered by trying to make this look like that or trying to help them in those senses. Um, Andy though had, Every transition for every shot that goes from from the 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 flashback to the present tense, to so the past tense to the present tense, every transition was designed within the shots. You know, so we will finish this scene by I don't know panning to the left, and the next scene will pan in right to left, and we'll pick it up with the magic of our wonderful editor Jason Valentine. And I think the transitions are quite, quite beautiful and quite seamless in the movie. Some of them have the, the help of visual effects, but some of them are literally transitions done on camera. You know, we tilt up and then we tilt down. And when we get down, we're in another set, you know. The transitions and, were incredible. I mean, that 
that was one of the standout pieces, I think, of the film is how you're because you can ver- I mean, you could just do a flashback. People understand what that is. Um, you know, you would know there's the characters that you remember from two years ago when you saw the film. It looks a little bit different. The time period's different. But you went to that extra step of really creating transitions um, in post, but also in, in, you know, physical with the camera. I mean, it, it really was great. I think that other than the other than the philosophical lighting approach and the camera approach to that, I would like to give all the credit to Andy. He had the transition in his head, you know, and he transmitted to Angelo Colavecchia, our operator, and uh, our wonderful operator, and they came up with this up and down moves, left to right, and, and lens matching. And my job was to try and keep up with with their appetite and their creativity in, in a lighting situation that was extremely complex, but yet very organic. So I had to deliver that to Andy, all of it. Let's take a quick moment and talk about magnanimous rentals over at magrents.com. They are an equipment rental house. They're based in Chicago, but they ship anywhere in the country. So That's great uh, for those of you that live here in the U.S. Um, They've got a fantastic inventory of all the gear that you're looking for, of course. But really, where they stand out are their prices. Their prices are unbeatable. It really is incredible. So you go to their website, and just their regular prices are incredible. But then on top of that, they have these things called flash discounts. And these flash discounts are items that are steeply discounted but for a very limited time. So you got to go to magrents.com every day and check out what they have. Again, their regular prices are fantastic, but when they have a flash discount, take advantage of it because it's a limited time and it's always going to be amazing. So head over there, magrents.com. And lastly, hedge.video. What is hedge? Well, hedge is a backup software for filmmakers. It's that simple. And that's kind of the point. We want it to be simple. They want it to be simple. They want this to be something you can incorporate into your workflow with no problem at all. And Hedge certainly is that. Since I'm using Hedge now, um, everything kind of changed. At first, I was backing up my media just on my desktop. So I was dragging files in the finder. And I mean, yeah, you can do it, but it's kind of a mess. And when you use a program like Hedge, it's a professional software. So you're using, you're like, wow, this is what I should have been using all along. Because think about it. Your media is the most important thing. It's the most important asset at the end of a shoot day is your media, right? And you have to treat your media with the respect and the dignity that it deserves. And that's what Hedge is. It's time to use a professional software. So it's super easy to use. Um, you You can import multiple sources, send it to multiple destinations all at the same time. They actually have a really cool little animation on their website that shows exactly how the app works and how easy it is. So if nothing else, go to hedge.video forward slash go creative show and just look at that animation. And if that doesn't entice you, then nothing will. (laughs) So head over there, hedge.video forward slash go creative show. By going to that site, you actually get a discount off the full license as well. How about that? Hedge.video forward slash go creative show. Let's talk about lighting in this film. Um, did you have a general lighting philosophy going into it? I should ask. I should answer yes. Of course, I had everything planned. Okay, but is that true? <laughs> no, <laughs> no, it's not. Exactly. <laughs> no, no, it's not. Um, How did you approach the scenes? Like, where did I, you start? I, I, des- I describe my days like, you know, I wake up in the morning, I find Andy, and he is running up a hill, and we climb the Everest, and we get to the tip of the Everest and I'm extremely exhausted and I'm so happy with we climbed the Everest and the next morning I see him again on the top of the Everest and I have to climb it again <laughs> and again and again and again for 80 something days. Um, it was an it was a, a massive undertaking. It was a relentless using relentless as a good word. It was relentless and it was massive in terms of every shot. It's a master that is done with a very wide lens and the camera is very low and the camera pushes almost to a close-up. So once you assume that that is the language of the movie and the philosophy you're going to approach it with, 
then your life as a cinematographer becomes very easy because you, you start thinking like the director and you start approaching things like the director. So other than, other than experimenting in, in several instances with new tools and new approach to tools, um, it was a very organic. So we were in a room and the room had the sun outside and my conversation with Andy would be, let me give you an example. When, when, when Beverly, the, the Jessica Chastain character, goes back to her nightmare and she goes to the apartment she was living in yeah. as a child, yeah. uh, she opens the door, she walks into the apartment, and the apartment is a very fair replica of the original apartment with different in, in set dressing and decor because whatever, 30 years has passed and someone else lives in there. Um, but there are hints of what it was there before. And I think the conversation with Andy is like, have you seen each other? One? And I said, yes. Okay. So this is 27 years later. My next question was what time of the day is it? You know, not in the movie or this, or, but what time of the day you want it to be? Where, the, where is the sun in relationship of the window? And he would point in the set and he would point like somewhere there, you know, with his very long arms. And, and so we will put the sun there and create the shadows that will, of the, 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 the lighting that will create this effect of mid afternoon, summer, you know, late afternoon, summer in the Northern hemisphere. Yeah. So that was the approach, the general approach. And then you go into the details of, well, now I see the light, so we need to change it a little bit, but it was more like a, an organic philosophical conversation constantly. Then we got into more the Pennywise world and where he inhabits. And that's free for all because Pennywise is this creature that has power over wind, earth, fire, and I'm not quoting a band, but uh, <laughs> uh, in life, you know? And yeah. So he controls those elements. So he would, he would make the, 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 his his environment light in a green way or in a dark way or in a flashy way, and and Andy like a like an orchestra director will tap the shoulder of my gaffer for the lighting to to flicker at certain pace, and the pace would be what the the sound of the the music or the sound of the the the, the breathing of one of the actors would be later on. So everything was very organic to the whole process. Um, in the lighting approach was, was very complicated. There is a scene or there is a, there is a set that is where Pennywise inhabits. And I don't want to give out some spoilers or more spoilers than needed, but where Pennywise, uh, inhabits where, where the losers go to try and kill him. Yeah. Uh, that is a very complex place because it's, is dead until they wake up the, the spirit of the, the presence of, they invoke the presence of Pennywise. And then Pennywise transforms himself into this creature that is going to chase them and try to kill them. And the lighting has to follow the arc of the story. And, um, and we, and the resources that we pour into that were, were emotional resources and, and, and technical resources were endless. I mean, from, from a little, LED remote control battery operated light that was brought down with a descender into a little hole the size of six inches. And the light came from 60, 40 feet up in the air at certain speed, repeated by a descender that was controlled by a stunt person. And, and my gaffer was controlling the pulsating light so the actors could have a light to look at. And, and, and the light will descend so therefore the shadows and the lighting source would change so wait, wait uh, let me do what scene are we talking about are you are you i'm trying to i'm trying to place that scene with this descending light are you wh which am moment am in the I film are we talking able about? To tell you exactly oh yeah just go ahead, without, go ahead without warner brothers to coming to be in my house and deport ah, me ah no but, the film's uh, out the movie's out i know the movie's out so who cares exactly okay. They they get into the cavern and, and and they invoke Pennywise. So this is the by, un, this, by is the, the urn, the, this is the, the underground urn. part yes, in correct. that like old house. They they no, go they go inside the old house and they go into this tunnel full of water. Yes, 
And then they go into what we call the cistern, which is this place where the original movie happens. Yes. And all the toys were piled up. Yep. And then they open a place and they go even deeper and deeper and deeper into Pennywise, the entrails of the monster or the entrails of the earth. Yes. Uh, and then they all gather in in one place and 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 they go around and uh, 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 and earn like a leather sort of container where where the the Indian tribe did their their um, ritual the ritual of chud yes and then they invoke the 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 the, the, the lights and they invoke Pennywise and they try to put it inside the urn they they cover it you remember that scene? yes yeah so the, yeah. the the sort of the essence of Pennywise near the end of the film is these three lights that sort of rotate and move around and they're trying to encapsulate it into this urn, urn. like you're saying. Exactly. So so you're talking about the how you created the effects of that light. Is that what you're talking about? Yes. Okay. Yes. So that was, the end result is this these three orbs that get encapsulated in this little urn made of leather that, that they try to encapsulate Pennywise there unsuccessfully. That took an extraordinary amount of, technology and wisdom and experience from my kind of Toronto crew, my, my gaffer, my beloved gaffer and myself to try and come up with, with that device that then visual effects will turn into three rotating spheres. But the, the, the original device, if you were to see and, and if that were to exist uh, uh, behind the scenes is this, pulsing, pulsating, very bright LED array of, of diodes that comes from the top of the set all the way down, 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 down at a certain speed, repeatable speed. Uh, and it, it's so precise that finally the actual LED fits into the urn. Mm. So we shot it as a practical shot. And then that lighting gadget or that lighting uh, engine was erased and turned into the the trees orbs. Wow, I am so shocked that was practical. Yes, I'm too. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and then, mind you, there were six hundred LED sky panels. Uh, disseminated through the ceiling and all of them were pulsating in a chase way. So it would create this sort of floating effect of the lighting. And they were dimming up and down according to the speed and the height of this orb. Wow. Yeah. Wait, are you exaggerating? How many did no. you really have? No, I'm not. You had 600? 300. 300. Wow. 300. Yeah. That's unbelievable. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that is, and, uh, and that, that, that's why sometimes I ask myself, I used to be an architect in a small country in South America, called Peru. And then I became a documentary slash, you know, news cameraman. And then all of a sudden I'm there trying to figure out what to do with 300 sky panels and a descending <laughs> light. And I'm looking at it and going, okay, let's do it again. Well, I was going to ask you what's your, what was the most challenging scene, but it sounds like that may have been it. Uh, Actually, no, no, no. No. But what would no, you say is the no. most challenging scene and why? It, it was a self-inflicted, a self-inflicted scene. Um, the, the character of Jane McAvoy goes to rescue a young, uh, a little boy that goes into the, into one of the horror rides in this fair at the beginning of the movie. Yes. And he runs into, into a, a, a house of mirrors. I and, can't, uh, I am, sh you know, it's so funny because I was talking about this with my producer and I said, I'm like, I really want to talk about the house of mirrors. And we thought, we, I was thinking to myself, that seems super complicated, but it probably wouldn't be. There pro there's probably some scene that I'm not even thinking about that was like the most complicated one. So I'm so happy to hear you say <laughs> that that one was super complicated for you. Let's dig into it. Uh, so he's in, a, he's in a big like mirror maze. 
Uh, yeah, there's the reflections tenant, everywhere. The, there's glass everywhere. Oh, it's a nightmare. If if you, as a director of photography, want to inflict pain to yourself, you come up with that scene. <laughs> um, it was great because Andy came up with, I mean, it, the, the, the script was, was written in a way that was very loosely. And he goes into a house of mirrors and not loosely in a detracting way. It was very free for interpretations. And then Andy, Andy said, no, I want this chase of Pennywise and reflections and things and and deceiving figures. And we have to, we we should do it in a house of mirrors. So I'm like, okay. So I went and talked to the production designer and we came up with this, he came up with this plan of, of creating a two scale little mirrors on, on some of like chewing gum. And so we place all these mirrors in a, in a floor plan. And I would say for a good half a week, every afternoon I would go to the production office and, 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 and go to the production designer and start playing with a little lipstick camera in my iPhone or his iPhone and, and start placing these mirrors in the best possible way not to be seen because you're a house of mirrors. So you see the camera, you see everything. My what, grandma, you were that, making like a model of it. You mean? Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. And so we came up with a plan that in theory would work. Um, and, and we came up with a way of doing it with two way mirrors, with some cameras being outside of the mirror. So you wouldn't see the camera, but because there are two way mirrors, it's dark, on the other side. So you don't see what the reflection is. Not unlike those police mirrors. So, so one side is a mirror on the other side. There is, you can see through. Yeah. Uh, so we like a created, two-way mirror. yeah, we created, I don't know, a 20 foot run for the, the camera to be on a dolly, just chasing the endless reflection of, uh, uh, James McAvoy himself, you know, and I would say I don't want to misquote anything, but I would say there are like three instances I recall out of this whole scene that is a good minute and a half long. Yeah. Uh, there were three instances which we saw the camera and they had to erase it. Wow. Only. So I'm very proud of that scene. Yeah, that's... I'm, I'm amazed that it's only three. <laughs> I was thinking I may, that you probably had to paint wrong, the camera out constantly. No, I may be wrong, but I don't think it was very, very organically done. You know? So it's safe to assume that anybody watching It Chapter 2 has seen It Chapter 1, which was shot by a different director of photography. So how do you bring your style to this film? I'm going to sort of use an analogy that I don't know if he's going to explain it, but I hope it does. I think cinematographers, I think of cinematographers like chefs, and it must be because I like to cook and I'm Italian, half Italian, so... I'd like to cook constantly and I'd like to eat especially. <laughs> and a chef is someone that goes to the same supermarket as you and as your friend and as the other chef and buys the same product. And we all try to buy the best product you can. And we go home and we have tomatoes, basil, olive oil, salt, and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. I guarantee you. You give those five elements or ingredients to five different chefs and you'll taste five different, completely, absolutely outstandingly, completely different dishes from each one of them. And it's nothing to do with the tomatoes. The tomatoes are the same. It's to do who you are inside and what you bring from your upbringing, from the museum you went as a kid from the books you read as a kid, from the sunset you watch with your first girlfriend, or from from the driving in, in the endless 405 in Los Angeles. I do believe that sincerely. So I don't know if I can answer better than that what I can bring different than other DPs. We're all different. And we all bring what we are inside. What I wanted to bring to each chapter two or to this project in particular was a different point of view of a story that was played by adults and it was to be a scarier and more uh, adult 
scarier and darker part of their, their journey. You are listening to the premiumbeat.com song of the week. It's called Zigzags by One Wave. Premiumbeat.com is where to go for all of your royalty free music and sound effects. They have an amazing collection of songs, thousands of them, all for you at 49 bucks each. And it's not just the song, they've got loop sets and cut downs and stems. So that $49 includes basically everything you need to customize the track to fit your project perfectly. They've got an amazing blog. They have such great talent on that site, really high quality music, and all of you guys should be going there all the time to check out what they have to offer. So head over there, premiumbeat.com, and check out this song, and of course, all of their thousands and thousands of others. Premiumbeat.com. And lastly, before we get to the remaining portion of our interview, I want to talk about Rule Boston Camera. Rule is the place to go to purchase and rent all of your production equipment. And there's a few different reasons. First, their inventory is world class. I'm talking cameras, lights, grip gear, communications, all the dynamics, uh, easy rigs, ready rigs, everything you could possibly even imagine are there. In fact, all the big, huge movies that come through Boston, they're using Rule. So if it's good enough for the big, giant films, of course it's good enough for all of us. They got an amazing selection of lenses, too, uh, that make them really the top of the industry, especially in our area. But the other reason is that they have amazing service. You know, they've got attentive and responsible service because production is mission critical. Not to be, like, overdramatic about it, but it's kind of true. I mean, you get one shot to do this stuff, and Rules got your back. They're going to give you expert advice and counsel in pre-production, They're going to give you technical guidance when you take the equipment out for your shoot, and they're committed to support you for the entire time that you have their equipment, no matter where you are. Now, what that equals, really, for all of us, is peace of mind. And isn't that what we want? We want gear that works. We want high-quality stuff. We want to have the selection and the inventory that we need, but we also want peace of mind that everything we have and everything going on is going to be flawless. That's what you're going to get at Rule Boston Camera, and that's why you should be checking them out for yourself over at rule.com, R-U-L-E.com. All right, we've got so much more to talk about, so let's get right to it. The conclusion of our interview with Checo Vereche, the cinematographer for It, Chapter 2. I want to talk about a couple of very specific scenes. There is a scene in, um, you know, sort of near the beginning of the film where Mike is um, uh, puts kind of like a, a hallucinogen in Bill's drink. It's near the beginning when he's just now about to explain to him about the ceremony and what they have to do to get Pennywise. Uh, the, there's this sort of camera jitter that goes, it, it sort of bends around Bill's face as you're watching him sort of react to this hallucinogen in his drink. Um, I'd love to know what your approach to shooting that was. Andy explained what he wanted. And a few days before shooting it, um, and that's how Andy, it's it's crazy and, and, and wonderful at the same time. Angelo Colavecchia, our operator, was taking his Steadicam and the, the assistant put the Steadicam on a stand and push the stand around. So the Steadicam was being pushed around in a very uneven floor with the stand. But the Steadicam has a, a device that is called the Wave that it takes the cent- it, it makes the Steadicam be the horizon of the Steadicam is always maintained by a gyroscope. Yeah. So, and by complete luck, that was being transmitted via the video assist to Andy. And Andy started screaming on the other side of the set, what are you doing? What are you doing? I'm like, whoa, whoa, hold on. I'm moving the camera. No, no, no. How are you doing it? So we came to this conclusion that we would put the steady cam on a riggedy lighting aluminum stand so you can move it left and right by maintaining the same framing on an actor's face. 
And because of the optics of that particular lens and the distance by which the actor was standing in front of the camera, the, the, the parallax of the background will change drastically. Mm. So we did that during the shoot. And then with some help of visual effects that just might be focusing and making it breathe in a different pace. Yeah. Um, it was done. Then again, it was 80% of it done on camera. The, that one particular occasion, I wouldn't, I highly suggest not to repeat it because almost we broke a steady cam and a couple of systems, but yes, that's <laughs> how we did it. Yeah. It, it looked really, really cool. And it was, it's another one of those things where sort of like the lights that we spoke about a little earlier, the, the three light orbs, it's one of those things that it looks so convincing on camera that you're thinking it has to be practical, but it seems it's so unique and so different that you're uh, the other side of you is thinking it has to be visual effects. <laughs> like, how do you even do this practically? It's, and, it's so interesting to hear when things are practical like that. Well, the, the, at the end of the day, the convincing things use tend to be practical. Yeah. It's easier to come. The suspension of disbelief, it's based on the familiarity of something twisted to an extreme that it's impossible. But you have to start with something that is familiar. If you start with something that is completely alien to you, it's not scary anymore. Mm. So that's why darkness is scary because little kids in the, you know, in the, the, the cavemen were scared to go in the darkness because the lions would live or whatever, the tigers would live in the darkness. So that as primitive as that. So the more you do practical and on camera, the easier is to convince an audience or oneself that if I don't believe what I see, the audience, the audience won't. So that's, that's, that's the mantra you have to start with. You have to be able to believe that that's happening. You know, let's talk about the darkness a little bit. I mean, this, I think that it chapter two is darker than it chapter one. It's more adult. It's more mature in a way in, in the storyline. Um, so much has to be revealed. You have to wrap up the whole story now in, in, uh, it chapter two, there's no more setup and you let it live a lot in the darkness. Talk to me about lighting for dark scenes. What's your strategy? How do you do it? One of the beauties about darkness is that you reveal as much as you can or want And whatever is not revealed. It's given to the audience to guess or to fear or to enjoy. So there is a balance, you know, the, the, the classical balance. And I don't want to be known by the guy that shoots the movies with the flashlights. I did a movie about the Chilean miners trapped in, 33, in a mine. Right? Yeah, the 33. Yeah. And now I'm shooting guys with flashlights on this one. So I certainly hope I don't become, become the flashlight guy. Um, <laughs> But the, the, there is a very thin, thin balance that you have. There is a very fine balance that you have to live with because the audience has to be aware that if you, if, if, if James McAvoy didn't have a flashlight, he wouldn't see what he sees. So it needs to be dark enough to justify a flashlight. Mm -hmm. You know, it would look stupid if he walks in a soccer field at lunch with a flashlight in his hand because everybody sees everything. But you have to give enough lighting so he's not in a complete darkness because you have to you have to pretend he cannot see, but you have to be able to see a little bit. So there is that fine line and it's very delicate. But once you achieve that darkness, then it becomes familiar and it becomes and the audience gets used to it. So there was there was constant conversation with Andy. It's like. Is this too dark? Is this too bright? Uh, do we want a source at the very end of the hallway so you see the length of the hallway? Is there a window that we have to place there? And he was very specific. In instances, he said, no, no, no. I really want to see everything because this is about the journey. It's not about the result. So there were specific responses to the darkness. But at the same time, I'm... Um, I'm one of those that embraces darkness. You know, I, I, I really love, and I'm going to quote a familiar place and I'm not going to pretend uh, uh, any of my friends looks like a Rembrandt or anything like that. Please uh, forgive me for quoting Rembrandt or the masters. But if you were to look at a Rembrandt, 
you believe that the background is very dark, mm. you know, but not really. If you look closely, there is a lot of detail there. So you understand where they are. They just happen to sit in the only shaft of light that the window to their left allowed that to be. So your memory is those, this dark painting with these faces in front. The truth is, it's not that dark. You know, there mm. is, there is, there is information back there. And the information tells you that there is this royal figure that was sitting in the throne in this palatial place. And maybe the palatial place is very dark because the royal figure was only sitting in the only shaft of light. Your, your, your brain remembers what he wants, but your brain knows he was sitting in a castle, whether you recognize the castle or not. So taking that as an example in, in, and believe me, I don't believe we did anything close to that, but taking that as an example, you have the characters sitting in a place that you can reveal their their fears or their gestures or their eyes or their tears, and yet understand where they are physically. And that's a there is a very fine balance. And it's a fine balance that I love to navigate and 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 I do it with pleasure. Let's talk about how you approach lighting pennywise, because what makes Pennywise so horrifying is that he's also kind of engaging. I mean, he has to toe the line of being completely horrifying and scary, but also alluring enough that you want to, you kind of want to step towards him. Like that's how he kills a lot of his victims is by getting them to kind of walk towards him a little bit, get closer. And how do you do that with somebody that is so horrifying? I mean, that is incredible. Certainly it's the performance, but I'd love to know if there's anything in your lighting that gives him that quality. One example of what you're saying is the, the scene at one third into the movie when there is a little girl playing, playing, uh, sorry, witnessing a, a baseball game. Yeah, she's like under and, the bleachers. That's, that's exactly the scene that I'm thinking about. Yeah, she's outside the bleachers. There is a little... Uh, her mom is not necessarily a, a welcoming character and she gets distracted by a firefly and the firefly sort of start flying and she follows the firefly and she's an adorable little girl and the firefly goes under the bleachers and the firefly goes into a very dark place. Uh, and that is dark, dark, dark. It's the absence of light. And then these two white gloves come out of the darkness, catch the firefly, retract in the darkness again, and very gently they open and they reveal Pennywise um, in his full beauty, scary beauty. Um, and, and he's almost so tender that he doesn't kill the, the firefly. He yeah. cherishes this light under his face. Uh, and the girl was gets drawn into him because he played brilliantly by, by, by Bill Sasgard. It's, it's, it's all him. It's his eyes and his mouth and his smile that lures the character and lures the audience towards him and, 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 and believes that he's nice until he's not. Cinematography definitely plays, has a place into that. You have to make him gentle. You have to make him uh, uh, approachable. You have to make him real to be able to believe that then he turns into these monsters. You're an, you, you have to love your antagonist more than your protagonist. If not, there is no movie. I mean, that's from the very beginning. I mean, yeah. that's Homer and, 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 and in the, in Greek, you call it the Odyssea, the, 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 the trip, uh, and, and the enemies of, of, of the Greeks have to be more appealing than the Greeks themselves. So when, when they lose, you, you, you feel for them. Yeah. So, that that is that is the, the the genesis of this whole thing. You know, you have to light Pennywise in a way that it's scary, but at the same time appealing. And that's that's an art that that it's 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 being perfected by Andy and, and Bill Sasgard and, and one a cinematographer only enhances that feeling um, by placing Pennywise in the correct amount of lighting. Let's talk about what is largely the most controversial scene in the film. And it's actually the first scene in the film, that gay bashing scene. Now, I know it's in the book, so it's nothing that's new. And anyone that read the book, um, you know, would have been expecting that. Uh, but 
you have to treat a scene like that with an incredible amount of attention and an incredible amount of respect. And I think you guys did it really, really well. I mean, it's probably one of the most horrifying scenes and Pennywise really isn't even in it until the very end. And there's something to the way that you made that scene so realistic and so authentic that I no, certainly the performances are great, but you must have done something in the cinematography and the lighting to, to give that scene the impact that it has. I think one of the, the first of all, I think the performances were brilliant yeah. in the, in, 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 and that's the key, you know, you, I hope the next time you and I talk about it, about another movie, we talk about how brilliant the movie is and not, not only hopefully not only how the cinematography was was paying homage to the script and the characters. And I think that's the base of it. It's it's a believable character, it's a believable situation, and it happens constantly. Unfortunately, with gender related crimes or 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 hate or with 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 colors or skin color related hate or with nationality related hate, you know, and, and that it's the reality of our century, this new century. Uh, and, and it's the reality of the last century and all the centuries humans have been around. Um, I believe firmly that the most gruesome violence in film is the violence that is not romanticized by slow motion and by, by trickery. The most violent violence is the one that looks like violence. Mm -hmm. You know, Um, I used to be a news cameraman and I witnessed, unfortunately, many, many horrible moments and all of them get impregnated in my retina and in my brain. So if there is something I can bring to that is the the immediacy of violence and the, and the, the unforgiven fear that creates in everyone when you see it, you know, and to be able to deliver that it has to be real and it has to be feel realistic. If all of a sudden there is a, a, a very sexy shot of 300 frames of a punch, then that's not violence. That is an apology of violence, that it's a, 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 a enhancing violence. So if you want to make it repulsive, you have to, to show it how it is. And mm-hmm. I think Andy was very on board on that. So we shot it as if we were witnesses of this this tragic moment, you know, um, and that happens with the few occasions in which we use handheld cameras and very violent camera moves that enhance the violence and the punches and, and all that, you know, I, that was the, the, the original approach. And, and the, the other thing that I think it, 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 it made you believe in it, it was the scope of the lighting and the scope of the town we were working. I mean, we had three or four blocks lit to, to the extent of you, the eye could go, you know? So it felt like it was happening in the middle of the town. So that was even scarier. It's not in a corner where nobody sees it's in the middle of the town. So 2,500 people could have witnessed this, but they did it in a way that you couldn't witness, but the camera was the witness for the rest of the rest of the audience and the rest of the town. So that's what I think it made it so horrific. Uh, absolutely. I mean, when I was watching it, there's this sense of helplessness because they're right there in the, in, in the street. Like the 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 um the villains in that scene, they weren't even hiding the fact that they were beating these guys uh, to a pulp. Like it it was incredible to see that it was just out in the open. And I think that's what made it even more horrifying is that helplessness and that hopelessness of the scene. And I think that was brilliant because. Brilliant. I think that was very successful because the same, imagine the same scene of these two guys being harassed by these three bullies or four bullies in, in, in a count, country fair. Uh, and then all of a sudden they go into a dark alley and you go, oh, I know this is going to go wrong. Yeah. And, and in the back of your head, you think, oh, these guys must be idiots. Uh, after that happens, I would take an Uber. You know, I, I wouldn't walk, yeah. you know, to this dark alley, but Andy was clever and brilliant in putting it in the middle of everything. So it really felt your feeling, I hope is shared by the audience because that's what the intention was. This could happen to anyone by no reason whatsoever. 
It could be because you're two men kissing, or it could be because you're a guy with a mustache and short with a sombrero in the wrong place, or, or, or you're black, or you're white, or whatever it is, or you're a woman by herself jogging. You know, it, it could happen to anyone. And that's the tragedy that I think it was so successfully portrayed. Well, I absolutely loved the film. I thought it was great. Uh, a perfect end to, you know, one of those timeless stories that I'm sure, you know, you saw the the TV movie so many years ago. And then, you know, when the movie comes out, it has a lot to live up to. And chapter one was excellent. People loved it. Chapter two, you even have to take it to the next level. And I think you certainly rose to the occasion and gave it something that was unique, uh, familiar, horrifying. It was everything I wanted. And um, you guys did just a fantastic job. Thank you so much. I really appreciate your thoughts and, and, and the conversation. We've been asking our guests um, lately to, to tell us like the one piece of gear that they have to have with them on set. Um, some people have brought up really simple things like a notepad and, you know, little things there. Some people have brought up things much more expensive and elaborate. Uh, so I'd love to ask you, what is the one tool that you have to have with you on all your sets? There is one tool I have to have, and I never been able to shoot without it. And that's important in my life and in my personal career. And that is an espresso machine. Ah, very good coffee. Good. What are you, what are you using? Oh, it depends on, depends on the project. Sometimes it's a very sophisticated Italian espresso machine, and sometimes it's a very reliable Nespresso machine. Yeah. But always a coffee every 20 minutes for the first half of the day. You know, we ta I talked about that with my um, director of photography that I used for my commercial stuff, um, Chris Lochran, because we're both big coffee guys, and we, I, I've got Nespresso machines everywhere. They're in my office, they're in my house. I, they're all over the place. I love them. And uh, it's something that we talked about, like bringing on set all the time. It's small. I mean, it takes no space and um, it's I'll easy to use. It's reliable. One day, I'll send you a picture one day. There is a Pelican case that has my name on top. That is very important. That gets flown all over the world by production because that's my tool set. And then there is one light meter and an espresso machine and a bunch of pots. Oh my that's God. It. That is yeah. awesome. Yeah. I very love reliable. that. Yeah, that's the only piece of gear I really need. <laughs> it keeps everything else going. I love that. It keeps, keeps everything in perspective. Now, do you share or do you keep that all for yourself? Oh, no, 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 no. It's the, it's the perfect bribing device. <laughs> yes. So you share it with everyone. And then when they're hooked, they start buying it. Producers must hate you if you're like taking a break, having an espresso, bringing the crew around you. Because every two, I mean, a producer's every second that goes by, they're thinking his money out the window. <laughs> so they must be like, what is it with this guy? And his coffee breaks all the time. It, well, but you'll be surprised. As far as soon as you give them one espresso, they don't complain about that <laughs> That's anymore. That's true. Where is my second camera assistant? Oh, it's having an espresso. Can I have one, please? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> that will that will be our pleasure. I love well, perfect. Now let's just set a date. You and I need to get together. We'll have espresso. We'll talk about filmmaking. I love it. You let me know when and where, and we'll both bring our own espressos and we'll talk about it. That <laughs> right. will be my pleasure. Where can people go online to find out more about you? There is an Instagram page, check over uh, and then the, there is my website, check over com. Excellent. Thank you so much, uh, Checo Varese, on uh, the director of photography for It Chapter 2. I'll put links to his Instagram and his website on our page at gocreativeshow.com. Uh, but go see the film if you haven't already. And of course, he's got a fantastic portfolio of a whole bunch of other films as well. So I want you guys to dive deep into Checo's uh, work right now. Just stop this episode, dive deep, watch them all, get into it. And we're so thankful that you came on the show to share your experiences. Thank you so much. There he goes, Checo Vareche, cinematographer for It Chapter 2, and so many other great films. Please do check out his website and check out his portfolio and his Instagram. You got to do that too. You know what else you should be doing is following Matt Russell and Connor Crosby. Why? Well, Matt mixes and masters and makes the show sound so good. And you can find him at gainstructure.com. And Connor Crosby is our producer. So for those of you that have been sending in your guest suggestions, it's him that answers the call. 
You can find him at ignitionvisuals.com. I also want to draw your attention to the Go Creative Show website. From there, you can subscribe to the show. You can follow us on social media, ask your questions to upcoming guests, and we will ask them on the show. And all things that you need to know are right there at gocreativeshow.com. And of course, our sponsors, Rule Boston Camera, Magnanimous Rentals, Hedge.Video, Shutterstock, and PremiumBeat.com. Without these people, the show wouldn't exist. So support those that support us. And we'll see you next week. Bye-bye.